So earlier this year, I got a incredible opportunity to be invited to be a part of, of a room. It's kind of a training, a uh, small, smaller group of people, about 80 in the room, uh, with one of the key leaders in really around the world. He's written a lot of books on leadership, um, countries invite him in uh, to, to train their whole leadership in a nation, uh, to come and to, to be a part of, of helping them develop their leadership. And, and he's done very well for himself over the years, really investing in other people. In fact, what drives him is he makes sure that he says, everything that I do is value to other people. And when you add value to other people, people are usually willing to add value back in return. So financially, he's done well. And one of the things he said in this room uh, that I don't think he shared, he's ever shared publicly, and so I'm not sharing his name, but one of the things that he, he shared was that he and his wife, they're now in their 70s, but they've put together an intentional plan to make sure that by the time, I think they said 86, but before they turned 90, but, but about 86, that all of their money is gone. Uh, they put in place um, what organizations they want to give to some toward their kids before then. They said, when we die, we want to die empty because there's nothing that we can take with us. Now, their kids have talked to them a little bit and they're like, here's the problem, mom and dad. What if you live longer than that? <laughs> and they're like, well, then we move in with you. That's just, what, that's just the way it works. That's how it's going to happen. All right, but one of the things he talked about is he's, he's, he's like, I know I can't take it with me. There's nothing that I can take with me, so why wouldn't I use it intentionally? Why wouldn't I make a predetermined choice of how I'm going to use things to invest in things that make an eternal difference? I think it's what really all of us wrestle with at some point or another, especially the older we get. What is the eternal difference my life is making? What's the legacy that I'm leaving behind? What do I have that is outlasting me? If you were here last week, we looked at a verse that Paul wrote to a young pastor. And if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to, to turn to 1 Timothy and 1 Timothy chapter 6. And if you weren't here, really encourage you to go online and, and to, whether on the app or on our website and listen to the message. Because it'll set up the premises of some things that we're going to dig into a little bit deeper today. And Paul's writing to this young pastor named Timothy, and he's encouraging him to teach people about this concept teach people about how they understand their, their resources and the legacy that God has placed within them. And let's, let's re look at this together. It says in 6, 1 Timothy 6, 17, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Right, right away in the beginning, he says, teach those who are rich in this world, which means we probably can be rich in another world. That there's something else that he's getting at. He said their trust should be in God who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment and tell them to use their money to do good, that they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. And when we read this passage, there's a couple things that stick out. And one of them to me is when he says, give, God gives us all that we need for our enjoyment, that God has planned for you to enjoy life. That is a good thing for you to enjoy life. He, he wants you, to, he's okay with you having a nice house and having vehicle and right, having, um, putting your money to work for you and investments and all those kind of things. That enjoying life is an okay thing with God. Having stuff is okay with God. But the problem is, and the issue is that God is saying, is he's got to make sure that your wealth and your stuff doesn't have you. It's okay for you to have it, but it cannot have you. He's saying you can be rich outside of this world. In fact, there's a, there's a richness that far supersedes anything that you can experience in this world. And when it comes to your money and your stuff, how you think about it is important. In fact, there's only three things that we know that we can do with money. All right? and if you have another one, let me know. But I know we can spend it. Just go to Target. We all know that, right? <laughs> you, you can save it and you can give it. That's it. That's what you can do with money. You can spend it, save it, or give it. And, and, and those are the three things that are happening. But the scripture is saying what Paul's talking to Timothy and what we're going to see again today is that the order of how we think about our money is important. That we need to think about it from a biblical perspective. And what the Bible says is we need to give, save, spend. Or the world that we live in tells us to do it the opposite way. It says spend, save, give. But the scripture says, no, we need to give, save, spend. Because if your stuff has you, it'll damage you. 
And, and that's why we need to, kind of like the person I heard speak, we need to predetermine ahead of time what percentage of our income we're going to live on. All right, because all of us have a percentage of our income that we live on. I talk about with new couples and they're getting married all the time. You got to set a budget and determine what percentage of your income are you going to live on? Because otherwise, what do most people in America do? We, most people like to live on like 115% of their income. I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't work very well for very long. And, and, and one of the things that we realize about scripture and about Jesus is that we know that the eternal aspect of life is something that really sets a foundation for everything that we do. That if you believe in Jesus, you believe that there is a life after this life. In fact, Jesus talked about heaven a lot, but do you realize that Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven? In fact, Jesus was gifted at telling stories. And we're going to look at one of the stories he told today. They, were, they had a teaching point in it. And he's told 38 stories are recorded in Scripture. Of those, 16 of them are specifically directed at our money and our stuff. So when Jesus is teaching, we have to understand that Jesus is up to something. But one of the things that's interesting is Jesus talked about money a lot, yet he never asked for it. He, he never took up an offering. He never asked people to give him money other than one time that we know is just an, a little illustration. So Jesus is up to something, and he's after something. But it isn't your money. It isn't your money. In fact, what we're going to see today is what God is kind of laying out in front of us is that God is saying that generosity is our privilege, but it's also our responsibility. A generosity is our privilege. We have the privilege of being generous, and we'll see whose stuff we get to actually be generous with, and we also have a responsibility of, being, of making sure that we are responsible of being generous. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn over to Luke chapter 16, and we're going to walk through this story together. We're just going to read this story and, and, and the way that Jesus laid it out. Now, Jesus was a master storyteller. He would tell stories in, in a way that most people would kind of lean in after a second, and they go, huh, I wonder where this is going to go. And then he'd usually kind of say something that they would, they, you'd go like, oh, that's not where I thought this was going. It's not where I expected he would go. Now, as we tell this story today and we talk about this, I want, I want to set this up. So if you're a guest with us today, like this is not normal kind of topic. We do talk about money occasionally because it's in the Bible, all right? The Bible talks about it because a lot of times people say, oh, church just talks about money. No, it's not about the money. You're going to see it's a bigger issue than that. It's different than that. But if you're not a believer and you don't believe that there's an eternal life and you don't believe, you're not you're quite sure about who you, where you put Jesus and how you put Jesus in your life, you can ignore all that we're about to say. You have full permission to. But if you believe in Jesus... And you believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And that there is life after this life. I think you might just need to pay attention. In Luke chapter 16, verse 1, Jesus said he tells this story to his disciples. Right? He's making this up. He's just making a point. And he says there's a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. There's a gentleman who has so much money that he has to hire somebody else to help him manage his money. And, and so he's paying him money to help manage his money. And he does it knowing that this manager is going to make him more money than even what he's paying him, that he's going to do a good job with it, that he's going to follow up on his assets and all those kind of things. But then it says, but one day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. And so the employer called him in and said, what is this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. I mean, you, what you're doing, you're not doing the job I hired you to do, so tie up the loose ends, get all the paperwork in order. We're going to come, we're going to close out this account, and you're done working for me. So the manager thought to himself, now what? All right, my boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches. I'm, I'm, I'm not an outside working kind of guy. I'm an inside working kind of guy, I, and I'm too proud to beg. Oh, he comes up with an idea. And he thinks about it for a little bit, and he, he hatches an idea. He says, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. And so he's figuring out in this opportunity, how can he use this last few moments that he has to ensure that he's still got something after this next moment is about to happen? He says, so he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. And he asked the first one, how much do you owe him? And the man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. 
And he's 800 gallons. Now, some of you just note if you're reading in different translations, sometimes in configuring of, of different systems and how the measurement is, you might have a little bit different numbers, but the principle is still that they're actually just in people's math skills. I don't know. They have different opinions. Uh, but I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. What he's saying is, I don't have a whole lot of time. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to change what you owe. I, I got to do this quick. I don't have many opportunities more to do this, but now you just owe half of what you owed. And the guy that now gets the bill, it says half of what I owed. You could probably imagine what he said. It's like, wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, if there's any, ever anything that I can do for you, give me a call. Maybe I'll take you up on that. All right, you get an idea of where this guy's going. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe a thousand bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. Now, pro- everyone listening to the story is going to be probably like you are listening to the story. We're like, this is just wrong. Like, this guy needs to go to prison. This guy is going to go to jail and he is going to serve time. What he's trying to do is going to backfire on him. This is manipulative and everything that's wrong. But that's not how Jesus tells stories. Because look what happens in the next, in fact, we're thinking he's going to get beat up on, but the rich man instead had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. The rich man thinks and he's like, this guy is thinking about his future and he's using his limited time that he has and he's being pretty smart. He's using the resources that he had available to him and he's making the most of his opportunity. Now, I know a lot of us, we're probably in the same boat as Jesus. We're listening to this and we go, that just still doesn't make sense. How can you commend this guy for being shrewd, for, taking, for being celebrated, for kind of taking advantage of, of his boss, that he was put in charge of, of managing things? But you need to remember, Jesus looks at money different than we do. Jesus doesn't see money the same way most of us see money. In fact, look what it says in, in verse 8 as we continue. He says, and it's true. That the children of this world, now Jesus is teaching and responding to the story he just told. That the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than the children of the light. What he's saying is those that don't believe in me, that don't believe in God, that don't believe that there's any eternal life, they are more clever in taking advantage of the time and the situations that they have. That they know that the life that they live is the only life that they have. And so they're, they're quick to make decisions. They think things through better. They're more prepared than the people that follow God. That they see the purpose in life better than the people who follow God do. And, and one of the things, again, people that don't believe in eternal life have that plan. And he's saying, but if you do believe in eternal life, compared to them, you're a bunch of lightweights. You're not thinking this through. You're not looking at things from the right perspective. See, they only have a little bit of time and they know it. There's only a limited of time for their life. So take advantage of everything so they can keep living their best life. And he was commending him because he took advantage of the opportunity that he had for something greater. See, if you don't believe Jesus and you don't believe he's the eternal creator... The only thing that we have to take advantage of is the world that we live in. And and what I'm about to say after this, what Jesus is saying, you don't have to pay any attention to because it doesn't line up and doesn't make sense and that's okay. But if you believe in Jesus and if you're a follower of Jesus, what Jesus says might have an impact on us. That if you think that what we have here on earth then is just a portion of the time that we have available to us, shouldn't we take full advantage of the little bit of time and the opportunity that we have. So Jesus follows it up with this command. He gives him a command. He says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources. Use your worldly resources. You notice how he puts that qualifier on there. All right? These things that, another translation, maybe even a more literal way of saying it, is use your unrighteous resources. And what he means by that is there's no eternal value in it. Your resources that have no eternal value. That when this life is over, they're done. They're only good on this world. That's it. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, you will be welcomed into eternal homes. 
What he's saying is that there is something that you can do with your temporary resources, the resources that only work here on earth, even though they have no lasting value, can be used to create and speak life into something that has even more value. That's what he's trying to get. See, and remember, Luke is writing this story, and this is really important. Luke is writing this story after Jesus has died on the cross and has rose again. That Jesus has already come and he has experienced death and he's defeated death. And if anyone has the right to speak at what is beyond the grave, it would be Jesus. If anyone has a right to speak at what is eternal, because if Jesus who predicted his death and predicted his resurrection and then died and rose again, if, if he, he, I think he has authority to speak into what is eternal. If he didn't rise again, this story wouldn't make any sense. But because he did, it has some merit to us. And what Jesus is saying, he's saying that money is just simply a tool we use. Money's just a tool. That's it. Money is just a means to an end. It's a simple tool that we use in this life. You know, I was thinking over the years, I've done several home remodels, and uh, I grew up in a home that um, my dad's not a carpenter, and uh, um, he, actually, we, our original house I grew up in was kind of a HUD home, and, and we had a, the second, or the story and a half. The second part was unfinished. And, you know, it took only about 14, 15 years for him to finish that up there. And uh, <laughs> we weren't allowed to go up while he was working on that project because there was words we would hear that we weren't supposed to hear when we were kids. So I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to have to pay my dad for that story. It hit me the other day. He was here visiting and he says, I pay my kids if I use them in an illustration. He's like, so do I get paid? And I'm like, oh, darn it. I'm going to have to pay him for this one because um, I know he listens. <laughs> That's the piece. So, so dad checks in the mail. All right. And, uh, but what, so I, didn't, I learned a lot just trying. And one of the things I started to learn pretty quickly is it needed, I needed to have the right tools in order to do the right job. And some of the jobs weren't that hard, but if I didn't have the right tool, they were crazy difficult. And so during my remodeling projects, I'd invest in some tools, a few that I was renting, but a lot of them I'd purchase and have to, div that would have to include that into the cost of the project and what was taking place, doing tile, right? I had to get a good tile saw and make sure that I'm cutting those things correctly. And then when I'm finished with the product though, when I'm finished with the remodel, I didn't take my tools that I'd paid all this money for. In fact, I got a pretty nice set of tools on some things. Yeah, I remember we had a friend who does construction for a, uh, his life and you know, his tools at work, but he came to my house and he goes, this is not right that a pastor and a professor has better tools than I have. Right? He was, he's like, honey, I need to go buy some more tools. That was his excuse. And, uh, but you know, I didn't put him in the, in the bathroom. I didn't set up the, the wet saw in the bathroom and go, this is part of the project. Right? The tool was a part of what made it happen, but it was just a means to an end. It goes in the shelf. It goes into storage, or I sold, sold it and said, I don't need it until I use it again next time. It was just a means to an end. It was simply a tool. And what Jesus is saying here is that the resources that we have here on earth are simply a tool to help us feed into some more eternal things, to have a better eternal perspective. And he's not just saying, just give an offering. He's saying, use what you've been given to create something that's going to outlast you, to create something that's eternal. See, the manager was commended for taking full advantage of his limited time and his opportunity and that begs the question for us, how are we using our temporary God-given resources to create a means to an end that isn't just focused on me, that isn't just focused on a temporary thing that I have here in this earth? Do I have access to something that builds eternal value? Am I creating something that's going to last longer than what I have? And I think most of us know that when we invest in something that's beyond us, that's when true joy comes. That's why money truly is also a test. Money's a test. That's what Jesus is laying out in front of us. Money is gonna show you what you really value. What is it that you really value? I think we all know this is true. Money is not the meaning of life, but it can make life more meaningful. But we have to predetermine ahead of time what it is that we are going to use the money for. See, if you're making your life meaningful just for the temporary life here, just for the simple life that we live here, and that's all you're doing to make money, to make things meaningful, then that's all you'll ever get out of it. The value that you have is just the value that you experience here. It won't last longer than that. But if you're truly a Christ follower, 
and you believe that there's a life after this life, then you want to build something that has value beyond just this moment, just beyond this opportunity. Use your time and your talent and your treasure to build God's kingdom. What can I do that builds God's kingdom more so than just building what my kingdom is? See, the test is this. What are you building with what you have? Jesus continues the the teaching and he says, if you're faithful in little things, you're going to be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, right, unrighteous wealth, wealth that just is here for a moment, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Who will trust you with those things that have value beyond what we just know right now? And ultimately, what, value, what money is testing is it's showing who you trust. It's showing who is it that you trust. Do you believe that there's more to life than just your life? That's what it's showing. It's showing who you trust. And how do you know what it is that you trust? It's when you make predetermined decisions about where you put your trust. When you make predetermined decisions about what you're going to build, what you're going to use. That's why couples, when we get married and we have to sit down and there's moments in life when we have to adjust our budgets and we have to change some things. Hey, we got a kid going off to college or we got this extra medical stuff that comes and we have to predetermine what it is that we set up and what it is that we're working towards. Because if we don't predetermine, all we're doing with when, and trusting God, we're saying we trust God, but really if we don't predetermine it, we're just tipping God. All right, tipping is just what you do in the moment. Did I, get good, did I get good service this week? Do I tip for a coffee or do I not tip for a coffee? You know, did I, do I tip 15%? Do I tip 18%? Is this one, oh, it was kind of a rough day today. It's 12%. You know, like, no, no, t- round it up to 20%. You know? but, but we tip God because it's what we felt in the moment. But when it's predetermined, it shows that we trust You see, the greatest thing, I think, in in the American culture, what most of us really chase with our money is stability. If you really boil it down, what most of us are trying to build with our money is stability. I don't want to live paycheck to paycheck. I want to make sure that my kids are provided for. I want to have a good you know, value in my car. I want to make sure that I have things when I retire, that I can do what, the things that I want to do and chase. We're looking for stability. Stability is the American dream. And we look at what God is asking us, and sometimes we say that cost is too high because we're putting our stability maybe at risk is what we're telling ourselves. But then we have to ask, who do we really trust to give us the most stable life? Is it ourselves and our ability to create wealth? Or is it in the creator of the universe who creates all things and gives it to us? Who is it that we truly trust And how you predetermine those decisions shows how you've predetermined who you trust. So what I want to do, I want to just make this incredibly practical, right? Jesus is telling the story, and and, and this is one of those services where in in a little bit is, is, uh, if you like people watching, look around, because there's all kinds of people are going, oh, uh." And you're watching them have conversations with me, right? <laughs> and, and I don't have any authority to say these things. I'm just, in a sense, or making you do anything. I'm just saying this is what Jesus taught. And if we say that we're going to follow Jesus, we have to pay attention to some of the things that he taught. Because some of the things that he taught make us scratch our heads and go, oh, I'm not sure if I totally understand that. So I want to make it really practical. Because Jesus continues and he says this. Look what he says in verse 12. Because if you're not faithful with other people's things... Why should you be trusted with things of your own? Most of us go, well, it is my stuff. It's my motorcycle. It's my garage. It's my car. It's my business. It is my stuff. Is it really? How long can you keep it? Can you keep it for eternity? Or is it only for a season? And if it's only for a season, then we are not the owners of it. In fact, that's why what we have to do is we have to change our perspective from being an owner to a manager. That we are managers. We are managers of God's resources. God gives us everything, and he's called us to manage it well. How are you using what God has given you to create something beautiful that will extend his kingdom? 
Right? This is why we say give, save, spend, and put things in that order, because we want to build things that have eternal significance. Now, think about this. If you're a money manager, and I know there's several people that have money managers, and many of you have hired money managers, working on your retirement accounts and working on investments, and we want to use the money to make money, and you're going to hire a money manager, and you're going to pay them to help manage your resources and give the time and attention, and you're going to trust that they're going to do well with it, and you hope that they do well too. Because if they do well, that means you're doing well. And and so in management, it doesn't mean that God's saying, no, I'm going to strip you down of everything and you're going to be in poverty and all those things. No, he wants to bless you through the process. But remember, it's not yours to begin with. God, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that this little phrase, uh, that God will get it to you if he knows that he can get it through you. That if he knows that he can get it through you, there's some things that he'll open up for opportunities for you um, to be able to build things. And that's why we have to ask ourselves this question. Am I taking full advantage of the limited time and opportunity? Am I managing what God has given me well? Am I creating the home? Am I creating the family? Am I creating opportunities and using the perspective that God has placed to make sure that it isn't mine? All of it's his. See, from a New Testament perspective, it isn't limited to 10% or that of of our income. We'll talk about that maybe in a second. But it's really 100%. 100% of it is his. And that's why we need to also change our perspective on what we're building. What is it that we are building? You have to decide now what you are building and what's going to last a lifetime. This is is why you have to pre-decide what you're going to give. Because if you don't pre-decide what you're going to give, if you don't pre-decide what order you're going to put things in, if you don't pre-decide how you're going to set up what, who you trust, I'm just going to tell you, and I think we all know this, your appetites will consume it all. If you don't make a pre-decision, your appetites will consume all of it. Because all of us have these appetites that we want to consume. And, and in our culture, we know that most of us, it's, it's the accumulation of wealth. It's, it's upgrades. It's fashion forward. And it's just a house full of stuff. That at the end of the day, that's what we're going to have. That's what drives us. That's what motivates us. That it is that becomes the end. Not just a means to the end. It becomes the end. And, and if you ever had somebody that you've loved or part, a family member or somebody that had passed away or you moved into kind of the home, it was time for the home to be done and move into assisted living or something and you've gone through and you've cleaned out the house, you understand this kind of statement. Oh my goodness, there's so much stuff. Right? There's just stuff everywhere. And, and, and in that process, it, you're just overwhelmed a little bit by the accumulation of stuff. And when it's all said and done, a lot of it just goes to the dump. A lot of it just gets wasted. And the only thing that matters, the only thing that lasts and outlasts us are souls. It's the eternal nature of the individual, of the human being. That's why what our passion needs to be is more changed lives. And what we should be fixated on, on everything that we do, how we're creating, how we're managing, the perspective of what we're building. We're building things that help create more changed lives. I watched an interview with a young man who plays football here, here in the state, and he's a, um, you could tell by the way he's made his conversations, he's, he's a believer in Jesus. And uh, he, he said, what pursuing a career because he's like I believe in people and I believe that lives need value and need to be changed and I watch him like his value what he's being driven for career what he's being driven for finance what he's being driven to try to achieve was that more changed lives so I have a former student who um was a pastor of church, kind of a, was a growing young church in the Twin Cities. And uh, for many years, they just lived in a school. They did the portable thing. They set up and tore down. And, and uh, they had an opportunity to get a building. And he was just overwhelmed with what that all meant. He had to get in the building, get in the furnishings, getting things set up, getting the financing, getting all the different pieces. And one particular day, he looked at his schedule for the day. And he asked his assist, it's, person was helping him with his calendar saying, what's this appointment? Oh, I forgot to talk to you about that. Yeah, this person needs to meet with you. They've set this up like th- four weeks ago and uh, it's too late to cancel it. And he's like, I do not want to go to this appointment. And he has to drive like 45 minutes to meet with somebody that he's never met before. And so he drives down to a small town just south of the cities and he walks into a diner. And as he walks into the diner, there's an older gentleman in coveralls who walks up and grabs his hand and says, hey, pastor, good to meet you. Thanks for coming. And he sits down and, and, and as he sits down, he starts telling him 
about his daughter. He goes, my daughter started coming to your church just under a year ago. And she has been a mess for a while. We've worried about her. There's been all kinds of difficult things that have gone through her life. She's been in one relationship after another, and there's just not been stability. But since she started coming to your church, her life is completely different. Her life has completely changed. And if your church helps and change people's lives like that, I want to invest in it. And out of his overalls, he pulls out a check and he hands it over to pastor and, and he opens it up and it's a check for one million dollars he's like pastor is there anything else that I can help you with he's like well we're struggling a little bit to secure financing because we just don't have a lot of history and all those things he goes well what bank are you using and he says the bank oh okay pulls out his phone dials a number says hey Joe yeah, this is, um, hey, there's a church that wants, that needs to get some financing for it. How much do you need, Pastor? Yeah, a couple, it was like a couple million dollars they need to finance. And he's like, okay, yeah, I got them covered. Give, give them whatever they need. See, when you invest in changing lives, it doesn't matter how much it costs. It doesn't matter what it costs because when you are a part on the other side of seeing a life change, so many things happen. That's why we need to change our reward system that we have from, from just pleasure to eternal joy. That what rewards us is not just momentary pleasure. See, when, when we spend money, one of the things that we know, there have been studies, study after study, that when we spend money, that there is a little mechanism in our brain that gives us a little dopamine rush. Right? Then when you buy something, you're like, woohoo, that felt good. That's why you, when you go shopping and you, you purchase something and you buy four more things at Target than you planned on buying, you know, and you walk through the aisle and you're like, how did I spend this much money? Because there's a little rush that we get because we're, we're anticipating an experience. But for some, maybe even here, it's like when you hit that next $1,000 mark on your retirement fund or the $10,000 mark on your retirement fund, you're like, woohoo, like, this is the little rush that we get. But how long does that rush last? Just for a moment, and then you need to replace it again. But when you have eternal joy, there's something that outlasts just the moment. See, five weeks from now, we are going to um, do what we call our annual miracle offering. And on that particular Sunday, we receive an offering. We just ask people, we ask you to give one day's wages. And we give it towards kingdom builders. So this is, a, this is an offering we give away. It doesn't stay here. We give this, uh, all that comes in. We say, nope, this is kingdom builders outside of us and we're gonna give it away and we're gonna make sure that we invest it. And one of the things that we're investing in this year is we've come alongside an organization that is fixated on reaching the 42% of the world that has never heard the name Jesus. They've not, re they've not heard the gospel. And did you know that there is 40, that of those 42%, most of them have never even met someone who has met Jesus. They've never even met someone who believes in Jesus, believes that Jesus is the Savior and Lord and, and can love everyone and forgive everyone. That's just not even in their concept. And so to reach, and most of those areas are very difficult areas to get into. And so what we're doing is we're coming alongside this organization to say, no, we want to blitz this. We want to put a bunch of resources together. And we're hoping on this miracle offering that as a part of our miracle offering, that $25,000 of what we raised that day, we can invest directly into reaching unreached people. And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what you spend at Kohl's. It will not, or at Target, or wherever TJ Maxx, wherever you like to spend, or whatever restaurant you like to go out to, it will not match what will happen when you are in heaven and you get to meet somebody who had never heard about Jesus, but because of what you helped build and helped create a bridge to, that they found Jesus and it changed a generation and has the capacity to change a nation. There is no different, there is nothing that compares between those two things, right? We can give for pleasure or we can give for something that meets eternal joy. Ultimately, what Jesus is saying is we have got to learn to turn our stuff into stories. Quit collecting stuff and build better stories. Jesus is the master storyteller for a reason. He wants us to understand that when we tell good stories about lives that change and the stories that we create are powerful stories. And will the story of your life be about changed lives, about lives that are transformed, about things that went beyond you? 
do you realize that when you give to the church, it's one of the reasons we, we know and biblically, and there's some other perspective things that we have that we could talk about. But when we give to the church, we're actually giving through the church, that you are become a part of every story that happens here. That every marriage that is restored, you are a part of that story. You get to claim it. That every child that's being dedicated up on the platform, that you're a part of that story. That every person that's baptized and they're saying, Jesus, thank you for what you've come and done in my life, you're a part of that story. That every aspect, every time that we have people that have come and they've been re, kind of removed and helped um, overcome drug addiction and the renewal of their lives, you're a part of that story. That we have teenagers here who are able to live a life of purity and purpose different from those that, that are in their school system or other friends that they have because you are a part of that story. And last night we had a group of our students that came and, and they, they spent their time and their effort because they wanted to raise money to end human trafficking. I love that. And because you've helped create a space for that to take place, that's a part of your story. You get to tell it. When you stand before Jesus and say, tell me the story of your life. Well, well this is one time. And I helped a group of the students. Yes, you were a part of that. You get to claim it. That's how God works. That's what he's saying. Because every changed life is a part of the story. And that's why we pray all the time. God, give us more changed lives. Amen. Give us more changed lives. Jesus ends his teaching with this statement. And a lot of times we start with this statement. But we got to set all the context up to understand why Jesus said this. Verse 13, he says, no one can serve two masters. You either hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Because money's just a tool. It's just testing, ultimately, who do you trust? And when we use it in the right way, and we use it in a perspective, God does some amazing things. And what I want to end with today is I want to give you a challenge. All right, now, I have no authority to make you do this. I have no, no right. right? It's, this is just a challenge from me to you. Not following up with anybody. We're not gonna, you know, check in and all those kind of things. You can ignore it completely. Remember I said before, if you, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Savior and eternal, you can ignore it completely. If you do believe in Jesus and you do believe that there's a life longer, I, I think you should consider, again, what Jesus taught. And the challenge is this, is I would like you to challenge you for the next two months. Jump in on the generosity journey. And the way we talk about the generosity journey is we know that for most of us, it is a journey. It takes steps to kind of get things in order and get things in line and, and move from save, spend, give to give, spend, save. So the first step, we just say give an initial gift to the church. To give an in, second step is to give an intentional gift on a regular basis. But what I want to challenge you to do is I really would like you to do this third step. And the third step is to give regularly based upon a specific portion of your income. So just to predetermine a percent. I don't care what percent. You, do, you figure it out. You look at it. You determine. How, let's, let's start trusting God. God says, put me to the test in this. So do a percent and just say, we're going to do this first. We're going to put that, our trust in God and we're going to take a percent and we're going to regularly give it for, for two months. And the next step in growth is then you get to the point where you trust God as the source of all things in your life and, and you tithe and that's 10%. And then you even further beyond that, God wants us to live fearlessly and to give to kingdom builders and invest beyond that. Because I really do think the more God, we understand that God, when he knows he can get it through us, he'll get it to us. But here's what I want you to notice during the challenge. During these two months, I want you to pay attention to the tension that this causes in your life. Where is the tension point? Where, where is it that you're going, oh, we got to adjust our budget, and I'm not sure if we can adjust this. Where do we adjust that? And it kind of forces you to have those kind of conversations. And do I want to give this up, or can we give that up? And what does this really look like? Because what it'll show and it'll speak to you is it'll help you have a conversation with God. In fact, I encourage you to duke it out with God during this time because he's the one that gives the challenge. This is going to show you where you really trust. Where are the points in your life where you're more consumed with this life than you are the full life that he has for you? All right, he wants you to have good stuff. He wants you to have those things. That's, that's totally fine. Not, that's not the conversation. But where do we adjust and trust? The very end when Jesus told the story in verse 14, look what it says. It says, the Pharisees who dearly loved their money 
heard all this and scoffed at him. They listened to it and they said, you don't get it. But then Jesus did something remarkable. The one who has access to all the resources of all creation went to the grave or went to the cross and died. And after he died, he went, says that there were the days that he was in hell, he overcome death and hell and sin, and he rose again. And when he rose again, he says, I have the authority to speak to what has true and lasting value. And he is the authority to speak to what's true and lasting value. And he's saying, I am giving to you. And so that's why you have the privilege of giving. That generosity is a privilege, but it's also a responsibility because he set you up as a manager to prepare for the fullness of his kingdom. And either we're gonna invest in more changed lives or we're gonna invest in the accumulation of stuff and feed our appetites. Let's pray. God, there are times when your word is challenging. There's many times that we've said over and over again that following Jesus is simple, but it is never easy. And God, what you've spoken to us today through your word is you've laid out a challenge for us to help us understand a bigger perspective. That you want us to take full advantage of the limited time and opportunities that we have here on this earth so that we can create something that lasts eternally. God, I'm so grateful for so many that have already given a, a portion of their lives in that way, that there are stories that have happened here at CR First for decades, that they're a part of that story. Or the reason we exist here is we exist to see more changed lives. We want to love and lead people into an authentic, life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's it. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. That's why we create what we create. It's why we put in motion what we put in motion. And we just pray today, God, Will you teach us to trust you a little bit more? Will you teach us to have a perspective that's a little bit more anchored in your eternal reality? Maybe you're here today, and, and one of the things that maybe the, the first step, which is a really hard step, is saying, God, I think I really do believe, Jesus, who you say you are. That you truly did overcome death and my sin in the grave, and that I want to give you my life, right? That's the greatest gift that we can give to Jesus. That's the greatest thing that we can do in response. And so if today is a day where you're saying, Jesus, today I want to give you my life, that's the first step in all of this. I want to see you change my life.